but uh, we will start now the student experience uh, of uh, a lot of the students that went on an internship with uh, a support from FusionNet. And um, I'm gonna ask, let me see, because we changed the schedule a little bit. Uh, Diana, are you already available? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So okay. I want to introduce Diana uh, Shrigelli, if I say it right. Shrigelli, yes. Uh, it's a very nice name, but it's very difficult to pronounce. Uh, yes. You went to Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, please go ahead and tell your story to uh, the other students here available. Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so hello everybody, my name is Diana Sgrelli and I'm a master's student at Politecnico di Torino, where I am studying my master in nuclear engineering. And uh, today I would like to introduce you to my master thesis, which took place at UBC Barcelona and was founded by, uh, by FuseNet. Uh, I was there for six months and it was a very nice experience. Barcelona is an amazing city and I had a really positive work experience even at, at UBC. So the, um, the topic of my thesis is um, understanding a little bit better the tritium transport inside the permeter against vacuum, the PAV machine for demo reactor. So just a brief outline um just the next topic will be the next slide will be the an introduction to the topic then a couple of slides on the cfd model that i developed at upc which took the bulk of my time was i took around five months to develop the model then a slide on the validation the validation process for my model then one for the sensitivity analysis study and finally the goal of my master thesis which was the derivation of the mass transport coefficient and something also on some future work. So just briefly, um, the one of the main goal for demo reactor will be to achieve tritium self-sufficiency. Um, this is a schematic of the tritium cycle. And we all know that tritium is part of the fuel for the fusion reactor reaction. And um, it can be produced uh, in the breathing blanket with uh, the water cool lithium lead design. And then it can be transported out of the breathing blanket with a liquid metal. This would be lithium lead for this design in particular. Then the mixture of liquid metal and tritium will enter the TERS, which is the tritium extractor and removal system which separates the liquid metal from the tritium, and then pure tritium will be injected again into the plasma chamber. A key, a key component of the test is the PAV, permeator against vacuum, which is the component where I focus my thesis, and it has the goal to extract the tritium from the, from the liquid metal. So what's the problem in this? Um, there are huge uncertainties on the physical properties, especially transport properties of tritium inside the liquid metal, the lithium lead, um, but also through the membrane, which is a neobium membrane. And having these huge uncertainties, we are talking 1000% uncertainties, basically means that we don't know how the tritium is transported inside the pub. And if we don't know how the transport works, we cannot define an efficiency for this machine. And if we cannot define an efficiency, we cannot define a design. So this is important to find out. This is the reason why I develop a CFD model for the tritium transport. Um, I won't go too much on the detail on the technical part. If you have questions, of course, you can always ask. But uh, the one that you see on the right is just a sketch of the computational domain that I modeled. Uh, the dark blue part is the, is the liquid metal where the tritium is transported axially. Then you have the red is the niobium me membrane. 
And then here would be the vacuum, which was not modeled. So the tritium is transported axially, and then it permeates radially through the liquid metal and then through the membrane into the vacuum. And the permeated flux is the main parameter that was studied. It's one of the most important. Again, not too much detail, but just to give you an idea of what my, was my main contribution for this model, I, um, I modified the open foam solver, adding the transport equation for the concentration. And that in the fluid, we have turbulent transport. So I use the turbulent model as the CK omega, while in the solid, we have pure diffusion. So the concentration was modeled according to fixed law. But why open foam? It was for the boundary condition, because the boundary condition that I had to impose are unusual, and they are not available in the main um, in the main software that are commercially ava available right now. So open foam is an open source software that allows for a high degree of customization. So I was able to write my own boundary condition. And for example, we have these two, which are the main one. The boundary condition of the interface between the fluid and the solid is a third type uh, convective boundary condition, which uh, is different from the classical one, which is developed for temperature, because it takes into account the jump of the concentration at the interface due to different solubilities of the liquid metal and membrane. While the classical one for temperature, it imposes continuity at the interface. And at the solid and vacuum interface, instead, we have this boundary condition, which models recombination, which again is not a typical boundary condition that you would find. Um, so basically what happened is that the tritium is transported across the membrane in atomic form. And then once it reaches the surface at the vacuum interface, it recombines into a, a biatomic molecule. So yeah, that was my main contribution. And if you have any question, you can ask me because I won't go too much in detail on this. This is just a short video to show you how the tritium is transported. This is the inlet, how it is transported axially in the liquid metal through the outlet. And then this is, you can see the concentration, it um, decreases axially because it is, it is permeating through the membrane radially. Okay, this is the validation process. Um, we were very lucky because there were two experimental campaigns uh, ongoing on, in Brasimone, in Italy, uh, with a puff mock-ups that uses hydrogen instead of tritium, which is, you know, pretty similar anyway, and lithium lead. And they give us the results of the experiment, which are the blue uh, dots that you see here, and they give us the, the global permeated flux from the machine. Of course, I had to uh, modify my model in order to recreate as much as possible a complex machine. You see, it's quite, you see from this picture, by the way, I went to Brasimone, and you see it's quite a complex machine. So to reproduce it, reproduce it um, geometrically was quite a challenge, but these are the results. Um, we, we have a 30-40% um, discrepancy from the experimental and the numerical results, which is considered acceptable given the huge uncertainty that we have on many, many parameters. This process is still ongoing because I still need to add my own um, error bar on my own numerical results. This is still ongoing process, but this, this seems uh, a good results for now. So here the sensitivity analysis. Basically, I did a, an extensive literature review on some parameters, mainly diffusion, solubility, and recombination constant. And here is just an example with these two plots. You can see the effect that the diffusivity has on the permeated flux, global permeated flux, from the liquid metal and from the niobium. And you can see that the model is highly sensitive to the diffusivity of the liquid metal, 
while it maintains constant with the diffusivity from the niobium. So this is a, one of the main conclusions of my thesis is that the limiting transport mechanism in the pub is the one happening in the fluid. So this means that this is the lowest uh, transport mechanism and this places us in the liquid dominant regime. This is not, um, it was not um, a given result because in the past, many, many studies, uh, studies, they focus on the surface limited regime and diffusion limited regime, where diffusion is of course happening in the membrane and surface limited um, means anything happening on the surface of the membrane, which can be recombination or oxidation processes. But anyway, studies were very focused on the membrane uh, to speed up the, the transport of tritium. While now more recent studies and my model as well show that actually what's really important is what happens in the fluid. The fluid is the limiting transport mechanism. And so if we want to enhance the transport, the extraction of tritium, we should focus on enhancing the turbulent transport in the fluid. So this is the last slide, and this was the goal of my thesis. And it basically is the derivation of the turbulence mass transport, mass transport coefficient, because we it, it's clear now that it is a key parameter if we want to understand what happens in the pub, how the tritium is transported in the pub. So the two continuous lines are correlation for the mass transport coefficient while the, this dotted line is my result. So you can see there is quite a big difference. Uh, we have to keep in mind though that the correlation were developed for water, while of course my results are referred to liquid metal. So the next step would be to develop a new correlation, which doesn't exist right now for liquid metal in the same shape as the one developed for water, but where the coefficients are derived with, from a parametric study. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, you, you can ask me. Thank you, Diana, for your nice presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I did not see any nice pictures of Barcelona, which I really like very much as a city to go to as well. Did you like oh. it too? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. The, the last one was a picture from Barcelona, the last, last, last slide. Okay, thank you so much. And I hope you had a really good time and good time also for your research. And then uh, we will give the word to Menno Bakker uh, because he went to Eater and maybe he can yeah, show us his, his experiences. Hello. Hey, my Hello. Mano. Hi. Go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Let me see. Uh, share screen. I think it's this one. All right. Assuming that you can now see the screen in my presentation. Um, so, uh, for my graduation project, I've been to uh, ITER. So, this is the nuclear fusion reactor that's currently being built in the south of France. I assume you all know this. Um, and for my graduation project, I'm just mainly working on creating a system engineering approach to analyzing uh, the diagnostic systems to see whether or not they uh, achieve their requirements. So that's very technical. And however, for this presentation, um, I want to like skip most of the work that I've done. I want to mainly focus on my experience as a student in the south of France and hopefully give some tips to students that uh, might do their internship in the future at ITER. So, to, uh, next slide. Apologies. Yeah, here we go. So, to start at the beginning, uh, first, of course, getting there. So, if you do your internship at ITER, uh, there's two main cities that you can go to. It's Aix en Provence, this is the bigger city, the student city, this is where many of the interns also live. And the other city is Manosk. And Manosk is a city for the ITER employees that uh, live there with their families, so the children that go to uh, the international schools, etc. Um, the only downside to living to in Aix-en-Provence was I also chose Aix-en-Provence because of its student life. 
um, is just because it's a bit further away from Eater, so commuting is a bit longer. Um, getting to Aix-en-Provence, however, from Eindhoven, that's where I was doing my masters. You can travel both by train or by airplane. It's from Eindhoven to Aix-en-Provence. There's a train station there. There's an airport nearby near Marseille. So it's it's very easy to get to. It's very convenient and it's uh, yeah, very easy to reach. And for housing, and this I think is a good tip for all students that want to go abroad, that want to do their internship abroad, is um, trying to look for housing through the websites. Well, in, in the case of France, all the websites are in French, so it's very difficult. Instead, I also just uh, seek out contact with all the interns that are currently there. So in my case, I went into an ITER uh, intern group chat, mentioned that I was going to join ITER in March at the time, and asked if anyone has a room available. And within two weeks, I managed to arrange a housing. So it's very convenient uh, if you do it like that. Um, I have some pictures added for Aix-en-Provence. This is one of the main squares, one of the fountains, one for the nighttime in the small streets to give you a bit of an idea of the vibe in the city. Um, and the main city square, of course, this the La Rotonde, the city center, and it's a gorgeous city overall to live in, to spend your five months to living there with other interns and go out to bars, restaurants, whatever. Um, it's very compact, so you can walk everywhere. It makes it also very convenient, no car or uh, bike is uh, required. Uh, the Eater site itself, so this is where you will work. Um, from example, funds to Eater, there's, uh, every day there are multiple buses uh, going from Aix en Provence, uh, many bus stations. So the closest bus station to my home was like five to 10 minutes of walking every morning. So it's very convenient again. Um, commuting, as I said, it's a bit longer. It's two hours per day if you go to the Eater site. Luckily, if you don't have to work with your supervisor in the day or with one of your colleagues, working from home was also possible. So it saves you a fair bit of time. And finally, um, another thing I do want to mention is uh, it's a very long or a fairly long uh, work day there at Eater. However, again, French tradition, French culture, you have a very long lunch, an hour, one and a hour lunch with all the other interns, and it's very nice. So to give you an impression of what the Eater site looked like, this was a picture that I took myself in June. So they were currently, yeah, that Docomo building is finished. You can see it's closed off, and they were now building the uh, Tritium uh, building, if I remember correctly. So yeah, this is a nice impression, but also, of course, the great overview of the Eater site as a whole. And you can see that the um, at the parking space in the bottom right, this is where all your buses will arrive. Well, also the buses will depart. So it's a bit of a walk because first you have the uh, main building. This is in the bottom right. This is the headquarters where the cafeteria is. But here in the back, this is the building for all the diagnostics engineers and physicists. So this was also the place where I work. So going to lunch will take like a 15 minute of walk because this site is just absolutely massive. It's huge. and it's, I'm very impressive to work there. Um, so yeah, a little bit more about X on Provence itself, or commonly you just refer to as X. Um, and some of the things you can do around X, it's there's a lot, there's a lot. And Marseille is nearby. You can get there in 10, 30 minutes by bus. It's right next to a nature reservation. So for hiking, it's it's perfect. There's also Saint Victoire nearby. It's one of the biggest mountains in the area. Also great for hiking, and the Alps are fairly nearby. So again, some pictures for an impression of what this would look like. Is this was uh, when uh, me and some of the other interns were gonna hike the uh, Saint Victoire. We managed to reach the top. Actually, it took a full day, but you know it's worth it. And you can just see just the the gorgeous view of Aix-en-Provence and uh, the area where you would spend your time in your free time if you would do your internship at uh, ITER. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also a picture of Marseille for good measure. So there's the Mediterranean Sea, and in the distance you see Marseille itself. And finally, the Alps. So uh, another fun thing is that uh, Eater provides discounts or group discounts for uh, the Alps as well. So if you uh, spend your internship there in the winter, you can have a group discount and you can spend your time there with your colleagues or your interns to the Alps. You spend a full day there. It's very cheap. And yeah, it's again, this is where you want to be um, when you do your internship abroad, really. Um, finally, um, you worked at ITER. This is a very international organization. Many of the students on the other interns there are from all over the world, so South Korea, India, America, all the European countries. So 
very often they organize trips together as well. And one of these trips that we had was to Geneva. And luckily for me, one of the other interns made a video compilation of our trip to Geneva. So this takes about 50 seconds. I hope that the sound works. I think this will give you, a, you know, an amazing impression of what the student experiences abroad during your interview. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. So yeah, it's, it's, well, this is how I get to the end. And uh, again, I want to uh, mention this, a huge, huge thanks to FuseNet for allowing uh, or giving this uh, very generous funding to make this kind of trip possible to, uh, to have an internship abroad. Um, I hope I give you some impression of what's the other side of uh, an internship abroad is like, not just your thesis and not just work. It's also, you know, and the entire experience and the memories around it as well. And um, I added a nice picture of me with one of the uh, ETER modules uh, in the uh, uh, the Tokma building uh, as a final uh, slide. So yeah, if you have any questions about um, asking for tips for how to arrange something for your internship abroad or something in general about ETER maybe, it's you feel free to ask them now or uh, just contact me later. Thank you very much, Mano, for your very nice, uh, inspiring presentation uh, of these nice views that you saw in ITER. Not just uh, enormous buildings and a big complex over there, but also the nature. Um, mm -hmm. I think somebody will uh, absolutely contact you for some more information. Um, thank you for now. We will give the word to Lydia Pomayanshi when she is available. Uh, Lydia, I already see you. Uh, she went to PlasmaSurf, uh, one of the educational events FuseNet also supports. So, um, yeah, let us know what happened there. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Oh, one second. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about the PlasmaSurf, which is a summer school which took place in. Uh, the middle of July this year. Um, it was uh, held in Lisbon, Portugal, and it was organized by Instituto Superior Técnico of Lisbon. Actually, we stayed at the youth hostel of Almanda, which is uh, just across the river from Lisbon on the other bank of the Tagus River. We were somewhere around here. And the hostel was really nice, and it offered a really good view of Lisbon and the bridge. So it was better that we were on the other side because we could look at uh, Lisbon as a beautiful landscape. Now, onto the people. We were 24 students, uh, which came from 12 different countries. And what tied us all together, at first at least, was an interest for plasma. On the first day, however, we got to know each other better with a team building exercise, which you can see in the two bottom pictures here, which kind of brought us closer together. Um, this and all of the other outdoor activities were organized by Ricardo, which was our organizer, and he made sure we got everywhere on time and that we were in a good mood, having fun, because that was a big part of Plasma Surf to have fun all the time. For the courses, they covered a wide spectrum of topics. We had courses in the morning and then in the afternoon we had other activities. Um, so they were pretty generic to make sure that, um, I mean, uh, to, to make sure that uh, people from every background could relate to them. And this was perfect because the 24 of us uh, had really different academic backgrounds. Uh, we were from mechanical engineers to theoretical physicists and from PhD to undergraduate students. 
And what I really liked about the course is, uh, is that the teachers um, did an amazing, uh, an amazing job at uh, keeping them not boring and not too high level. Uh, because if you didn't know anything about the topic, then you could get lost pretty easily if uh, they went into too much detail. But also, if you knew something about the topic, uh, they could get boring. But uh, they really did a great job. And personally, I really enjoyed that I got to learn more about topics that I wasn't so familiar with, like Python and inertial confinement fusion. And we also got to visit, visit the university and see the experimental tokamak they have there, which was really cool. But besides the courses, we had a lot of other activities. So uh, this is what the daily schedule was supposed to look like. But this is what it actually ended up looking like. We didn't really get much break in the mornings, nor in the afternoon. And in the evenings, we could never call it uh, an early night because we lost track of uh, time talking and sharing our experiences. But don't get the wrong idea. We were tired, but nobody was complaining about it because we were really having a lot of fun during the days. But it could get pretty exhausting, especially after the activities that we had throughout the days, like kayaking. Um, he, he, this is a picture to uh, stop the stereotypes about physicists and to show that we are strong. We really do look strong in this picture. Uh, next on the schedule was rock climbing, which ended up giving us just a bunch of bruises and scratches but also a view from the top, which definitely made it worth it. On the third day, we finally got to surf. And as you can see, we weren't great at it. Uh, not in the beginning, at least, because then we got a hang of it and it got really fun. Uh, as you can see, we have full body suits because the water is way colder than I expected it to be in the middle of summer in Lisbon because it's the ocean, so of course it's cold, but it was about 15 degrees Celsius. So um, it was pretty hard to swim without, uh, without a full body suit. And the last activity we had was a sport called mountain boarding. boarding. I've never heard of it before this, but I can tell you it's harder than it looks because uh, we basically had to drop our feet onto a skateboard and then go downhill with this essentially no braking system other than falling. But even in this activity, no one broke anything, though I did manage to get some more scrapes and bruises. And we also took this really cool photo. And the guy jumping uh, above us isn't one of us. It's a professional doing this. But we were brave enough to uh, stand uh, uh, to, to stand under him. Um, so uh, we did a lot, uh, a lot of other activities that I uh, couldn't include here. We, we didn't see much of Lisbon because we were on the other side of the bank, and it was hard to. Uh, get uh, get to Lisbon by bus and also we didn't really have time because we were all the time on the run uh, and also the thing with the breaks and the time we I mean everything was fast paced because we wanted to get as much time outside as possible and all in all it was fast paced and uh, the week was filled to the brim with courses and activities but I got to meet some really cool people I made some friends uh, which I keep in, still keep in touch with and I learned uh, a lot of about plasma and overall I had an unforgettable experience which I would wholeheartedly recommend to anyone and so thank you for your attention and I want to thank FuseNet again for offering me this amazing opportunity uh, for participating in this summer school Thank you, Lilia, for your nice presentation and nice overview of beautiful Lisbon, which also combined very much a beautiful space with uh, plasma learning. So uh, thank you so much.